Hello, welcome to The Drum. I'm Julia Baird. Coming up, the gloves come off between the states and feds over Australia's vaccine rollout. And God knows they've got a lot to deflect from right now, not least of which their vaccine rollout. $54 a day. From tomorrow, that's what jobless Australians will be living on. But the government argues they won't be living in poverty. And in praise of difference, we meet the first openly trans person to be inducted into a mainstream church. Joining me on the panel, she's back again, economics consultant for Social Outcomes and the Climate Council, Nikki Hutley. Can you explain your little badge you're wearing? Uh, she, her, so that's my pronouns. Mm -hmm. um, so I like to wear this all the time, but especially because it's Trans Day of Visibility. Yep. Understanding that people just aren't always what you think they are and accepting whether you're she, her, they, non-binary, yep. it's important to be yep. aware. Awesome, thanks. And we're going to get to that later on in the discussion. And in Canberra, Professor of Food Sustainability at Charles Sturt University and former New South Wales Nationals MP, Niall Blair. Niall, good to have you back again. Yeah, thanks, Julia. Good to see you. And in Melbourne, author and trans activist, Navo Sisson. Great to see you. Hi, great to be here. Welcome to the drum, Navo. Thank you. And in Perth, founder of Modest Fashion Australia and chair of Roots TV, Aisha Novakovic. Welcome back. Hello. If you want to join in on Twitter, you just have to use the hashtag the drum as always, and we are on Facebook right now. Now, apologies for having to tell you this, but it's already the end of March. And if you're the sort of person that feels guilty for failing to follow through with New Year's resolutions, then have some sympathy for the government. They'd planned to have 4 million vaccines administered by the end of March, but only 670,000 have gone out. The Prime Minister has made the point of saying that target was previously abandoned, but that didn't stop his ministers apportioning blame for why the rollout has been so slow. We're going to help the states, but they've got to admit they've got a problem because they've done three-fifths of bugger all. Uh, and they are holding this nation back, and unfortunately our premiers haven't led on this. Uh, and I know Greg Hunt is trying to lean forward with our chief medical officer and say, what more support do you need? But I would have thought there's one lousy job they've got to do, and that's just starting to put jabs into people's arms, and they've been asleep at the wheel. Queensland's premier disputes this and says her state just hasn't received enough supply of vaccines. We need surety of supply, guarantee of supply by the federal government, and if the states are releasing their figures every day, I think it's only fair, fair and reasonable, that the federal government releases their figures every day. But perhaps even more unusually, the New South Wales Premier Gladys Berejiklian has come out swinging against the federal government. I was very concerned to read particular reports in the press today about the New South Wales government vaccine rollout. The facts that were presented are not true. We want to work with the federal government to make that happen, but I will not, I will not have untrue statements made publicly about what is a complex system. Let's get this really, really clear. Uh, the New South Wales government was asked to roll out 300,000 vaccinations uh, to the groups in 1A and 1B. Of that, we've done 100,000. The federal government was asked and is responsible for five and a half million people, and they've rolled out 50,000. I think the figures speak for themselves. Not happy at all today, and I think that uh, federal government should be pro proffering some apologies to uh, not only our government, but other governments around the country. Mm, some cranky state premiers there, Nikki, who were told that they haven't led on this, in fact done three-fifths of bugger all. Is that fair? Yeah, look, this blame game is really just not helping anyone, is it? For me, there's a lack of transparency in how this is happening. Look, if we're not at four million, that, there might be perfectly plausible reasons for why we're not. But how about letting people know, even around what qualifies you for whether you're in 1B or 2 or where you are, there's a whole lot of confusing messages. And really, this just does, you know, it's, it's pure old behaviour on behalf of the federal government to start going, well, it's all, all your fault. Why aren't we all acting together and saying, how do we help? How do we all do this together? My view is that since the start of this pandemic, the states have done the lion's share of the work. They have worked really hard. They have done an excellent job, even if I don't agree with every single border closure. But they've done a really good job in managing this. The federal government needs to be supportive, not, not name-calling. 
Niall, it's very unusual to see um, the New South Wales Premier there accusing the federal government of, of telling fibs, essentially. Um, do you think she was rightfully provoked? Look, I think it's it's probably just a, a, a boiling over of frustration. Um, you can certainly see that, and, and having worked with the Premier previously, um, yeah, it is it is obviously something that uh, that she's not happy about. I think um, I agree that we would just like to get on with uh, getting the vaccinations rolled out. I think it's actually uh, this argument is undermining um, an area that we know that some people have got some doubts about um, anyway. And we know that it, it can be done. I, I speak to you know, family back in, uh, in Northern Ireland and they've all had their vaccination. Other countries are getting on with it. So I think, uh, yeah, there's obviously uh, something going on here. I, we all need to just get on with it, get past that, because we've been told that the vaccination is our way out of this. We're seeing more lockdowns, more disruption to our industry. I think we just need to, to get on and, and, and stop the bickering, just get vaccinating. All right, for, look, for more answers on this, we're joined in Melbourne by Professor of Infectious Disease and Epidemiology at James Cook University, Emma McBride. Welcome to The Drum. Thanks for having me. The simplest question is, who's to blame, Emma? <laughs> look, I, I don't want to get into that blame game. I, I just think it's really disappointing that we haven't done better to date. We've been more than five weeks into the vaccine uh, program and nowhere near enough vaccination has gone out the door and, and people are, are still waiting and queuing to be vaccinated. So that's not good enough. I don't know who's to blame, to be honest, is there's, there's well, insufficient information available to, to make any judgment but, like that. One thing I would say is that uh, we, we've got to stop hoarding <clears throat> vaccines. Uh, just because we're giving people two doses doesn't mean we should only use half of our vaccine. We've got to get the vaccine out the door with the assumption that there will be more vaccine available in the near future, especially with AstraZeneca now that we're making it here in Australia. And this idea that the government, the, the, the Commonwealth government's holding half the vaccine back and every state government's also holding half of their half back mm. just in case they don't get another lot for the second dose, that, that's a misstep and that's got to, we've got to get over that. That's mm. one thing. Mm. And the second thing is, is that uh, really we're five weeks into the vaccine schedule now there should be no longer any excuse for anyone who's on the absolute cold face looking after COVID patients or after quarantine uh, who hasn't been vaccinated uh, going to work. They, they should not be going to work unless they've been vaccinated in those really um, you know, clear areas where, where they're looking after COVID people. Well, yes, I was going to um, ask you about that because the AMA has said that it's, it's been, you know, it's unacceptable for any of doctors and nurses to be um, working without vaccinations with, mm. with COVID patients. Um, you know, Jeanette Young, um, Queensland's medical officer, said she had actually been giving verbal directions to healthcare staff for several weeks and only now it's being made formal so that only healthcare workers who've been vaccinated can treat um, COVID patients from now on. I mean, is that, is that sufficient? Why would we get to the point where that's almost an informal or private directive instead of a public one? Yeah, look, I, who knows? Um, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to understand why uh, failing to vaccinate your frontline health workers could lead to a lot of suffering down the line. Um, early in March, it, one could have an excuse for... for um, staffing a ward of people who are unvaccinated. But by mid-March, there's no longer any excuse for that, I think, because the, the vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine for frontline healthcare work has been available since uh, the 21st of February or something like that. So everyone should have been vaccinated by mid-March. So if you think about it, what, what has transpired here uh, is a real failure, I think, of, of protecting frontline healthcare workers and, and by extension, their families and their patients and so on. So. Yeah. Um, I don't think this should be <clears throat> an informal suggestion. This should be a compulsion. Don't go to work if you haven't been vaccinated mm. and you work on a COVID ward. Mm. Um, can I go back to the first question I asked you? Because I think the, the, what, what our, our viewers or a lot of Australians are not interested in is, is blame or is, you know, any kind of public brawling between politicians. But they do really want to have answers about why this has taken so long. And there just doesn't seem to be enough information to be able to fully, you know, understand why. So, so with someone with your expertise, do you have insights that you can tell us about where the lags in the system might be and, and what information we should be asking to be released so we can better understand it? 
Sure. Sadly, I can't give you uh, a clear answer. All I can tell you about is my own frustrations at trying to find the answer. And mm. uh, look, clearly we had some problems with Pfizer and getting access to vaccines uh, early on. Uh, now that we're uh, looking at our own supply of Astra AstraZeneca, we need to think about how it's more about logistics than actually getting sufficient amount of doses. So how is it getting through to to the front line? And, and it's, it really it will soon devolve to general practices who are the people who are so used to giving vaccines. And look, my hope is that things start really ramping up in efficiency in the next days to weeks, uh, getting the AstraZeneca vaccine delivered through through general practices and and uh, that, that the bottlenecks that are in existence will, will, will rapidly abate. Uh, but I, yeah, I don't have any uh, particular answers, except that I, I do understand that there's a bit of hoarding going on just in case the supply doesn't continue. And I would certainly uh, suggest strongly that that doesn't need to occur. Stop hoarding, right. get the doses out the door. Yeah, you'd think that communication would, would, would sort that, could sort that out relatively quickly. I just want to bring in the rest mm. of the panel in, in here, um, Emma. Navo, what do you make of this, these issues with communication? Like, what is the, the average person, do you think, um, to think about what's going on here and whether we need to be worried? And does the fact that you've been in Melbourne, which has been under a very particular strain, give you, any, give you a different perspective on this? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting question. I mean, I certainly don't feel like I'm in very competent hands with our leadership. I think the way that leadership is communicating with one another is really disconcerting. And I think generally, I don't know what it is about the Prime Minister exactly, but I constantly feel like I'm in trouble whenever he speaks. Uh, there's this sort of just patronising callous way of undermining the intellect of the Australian public and I think that people are really sick of it including our state governments. Um, I don't know why when we went into lockdown it felt like I was grounded uh, but it's certainly bringing up a lot of high school trauma <laughs> that I'm not enjoying and I don't think people are very responsive to it. Mm. Um, and, and of course one of the um, you know federal government initiatives has been this aviation subsidy, Nikki, which was predicated on the fact that borders would be open, economies would be open. It's estimated that the Queensland tourism industry is going to lose 35 million by the end of Easter. I mean, so is that subsidy going to be effective? Well, you have got till June, but obviously what this has done is just so <coughs> undermined our confidence in our ability to travel again if people can willingly just, um, you know, lock down. And I think with Queensland, it's an interesting question as to whether they are doing it because they haven't invested enough in their track and trace systems or whether they genuinely think there's enough community transmission to be worried. And if it's just the track and trace, then they should not be locking down. I mean, we've lost JobKeeper. We're about to see JobSeeker cut as you mentioned before you know these industries are on the brink and the last thing they can afford to do is have a really big part of their annual revenue just pulled out from under their feet it's really worried we do have more I've just downloaded my $425 vouchers from the New South Wales government so I'll be out there spending them as quickly as I can <laughs> um, and we've just got to hope that more people do that but it does make you very nervous about about booking holidays do you want to comment on that that Emma given your um your experience in, in modelling and dealing with these yeah. kinds of projections and anxieties? Sure. Well, it, it, absolutely. It, it undermines confidence and makes it very hard for anyone to, to want to book an interstate travel when, when lockdowns can happen this readily. I said the other day, you know, we, we went from Sunday being told we've got it under control, we're used to this virus now, everything's fine. And then by Monday, it was, you know, no school uh, stay at home and there's a lot of steps that could have happened in between those two like mandating mask use on the Sunday would have been one step that could have been taken uh, so it, it really is a very reactive decision and I hope uh, well I don't think you need to keep your kids away from school and stay at home in order to have a good contact tracing system happening mm -hmm. and really the the effective contact tracing systems are when you say you have a very broad reach to defining who a contact is and then even contacts of contacts and everyone in that group gets alerted. But you don't have to make it, you know, the whole of South East Queensland or Greater Brisbane that has to stay at home. I, I don't see how that adds uh, any, any improvement over the, a very strong track and trace service. Mm. 
Um, I think you've got a little visitor, <laughs> little visitor knocking on your window I'm there. I'm having a, a <laughs> Skype moment right now. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. No, that's completely fine. That is work. This is life. Um, Aisha, can I ask you how the vaccine rollout is going in, in Perth? There seems to be more of a sense of, of calm, or am I projecting? <clears throat> yeah, please don't be jealous, everyone, <laughs> yeah. you know, that we're here in WA. <laughs> um, I have two points to make just listening to the discussion. So I really feel listening that I'm coming from almost an outsider perspective because the atmosphere in WA, I believe, is quite different. In actual fact, we have generally a lot of trust in our state government, as you all saw Mark McGowan won in a historic um, landslide victory just recently in the elections. Um, so a lot of people have been quite compliant and understand a lot of the reasoning behind the lockdowns. And we had like one person who was diagnosed and we're all quite well behaved. I can definitely relate to the whole feeling grounded. <laughs> um, and so that, that's that been fine. In actual fact, there's, I guess, another side, the delays can be frustrating. But if you think about how a lot of people, I know that we did some filming yesterday in the city around just um, interviewing random people about what they felt about getting the vaccine, mandatory vaccinations, to jab or not to jab, and people are still deciding. So in actual fact, some people might welcome this delay um, and think, gosh, we still are considering whether we're going to, going to go down that track. So there may be a positive, if I could put it that way, mm. but in actual fact, WA right now is the best place to live in the world. I never thought I would say that, we keep but I'm hearing very, <laughs> we keep very, hearing. very grateful to be here in Perth with our Labor government. The Republic of I think doing, that's it, doing the right thing. <laughs> All right, Emma, well, I'm going to let you um, go and deal with your intruder there. Oh, <laughs> thanks for having me. Urgent business knocking on your window. Thank you so much. For yeah, my son. Thanks. Cheers. Thanks. Bye. Emma McBride, McBride is a professor of infectious disease and epidemiology at James Cook University. Now, if you're a regular viewer of the show, you'll know that it's been some time since we were able to cover federal politics without a lifeline warning at the end of the segment. The unending stories emanating from the parliament of our country cover the gamut of rude behaviour, misogyny, all the way to serious sexual assaults. They show no sign of slowing down and the coverage is starting to bite for the Prime Minister, who's seen his personal approval drop by seven points in the most recent news poll. Now, this story has largely been driven by an indefatigable group of female journalists in Canberra. So we were surprised to see this headline in the Financial Review today, Campaign Journalism Targets PM. The piece by the paper's senior correspondent highlights the work of news.com.au's Samantha Maiden. You may know her as a regular on the drum and a key breaker of the recent stories regarding Brittany Higgins' rape allegations, among other stories, but it also picks out other prominent female journalists. Angry coverage that often strayed into unapologetic activism came forth from a new female media leadership. Laura Tingle and Louise Milligan on the ABC. Catherine Murphy and Amy Ramikas at The Guardian, Lisa Wilkinson on Channel 10, Carol Middleton in the Saturday paper, and a cameo by Jessica Irvine on the Nine Network. Nikki, how are we to read this story? What, what do you think campaign journalism is? And why is it that a series of stories about sexual assault might be campaign journalism, whereas a series of stories about corruption at a casino would be investigative journalism? Yeah, like so much that's happening these days, this makes my blood boil. Um, you know, there are plenty of stories written about all sorts of things and we don't talk about it as campaign activism. This to me smacks again of somebody trying to undermine the stories that are coming to light. There is no justification for any of this. And if there is a degree of anger that has come out in some of the female journalists' writing, it's because that women across this country are genuinely angry and frustrated at what is happening. But there is nothing that has been reported that isn't about factual evidence, about uncovering just the seamy side, not only of Canberra, but in schools and, and more broadly. Um, you know, to, to attack journalists as being activists, it just doesn't make any sense. Otherwise, every journalist is an activist for writing any story ever, surely. Mm. Aisha, how, how do you see it? I mean, it's, it's easy to look at this and think, oh, why are they banding together a, a, a group of women? And it's almost the assumption that they're being driven by something other than mm. kind of logic, evidence and a desire for more evidence. 
I think there is an insidious implication and assumption to undermine the voice of women and this whole narrative and that old trope of, well, she is just histrionic and she's over the top and highly emotional and at worst this sort of, you know, those are a bunch of feminazis and so on, rather than looking at the content of their arguments and actually saying, you know, we all have to um, take note of what is being said. Talk about the angry women. Well, you know, there's a lot to be angry about, but it's not about women getting angry. It's about <laughs> humans getting angry. Um, it's not just about women's issues. These are men's issues too. We mm. all need to um, become activists. And they use activism and activists like it's a dirty word. For me, that's a, a, a badge of honour in actual fact. Mm. And in fact, there's been a group of women. I mean, it can be seen as a form of gaslighting as well, could it not, to say a group of women saying, oh, there's... There seems to be rapes that's happened in Parliament House. No, no, no. And there's more. Yes. And then there's yeah. more. And then there's more. And going, all the ladies are campaigning. Now, it is, is built into this, perhaps, Navar, a assumption that the only truly objective people are a group of men, white men. Yes. Uh, and if you've met men, that's just not true. It's a performative confidence. I often give people the advice to carry yourself with the confidence of a mediocre white man. Uh, if we all did that, we would probably accomplish a lot more. Um, because a lot of white cisgender men have not ever had to uh, apologise for themselves or be conscious of the space that they take up. And so they speak with this air of authority that they haven't necessarily earned. And then there is this sort of idea that men are objective in everything that they say and that anyone outside of that group is subjective and emotional and biased. And that's just not true. We are all subjective somewhat, you know, everything is subjective to certain extents. Um, and I just ask the question, if you're not angry about this, why? Why aren't you angry? And I think that reflects so much more mm. on the people who are unemotional than it does on the people who are. Mm. Niall. Look, I, I think, firstly, I, I found the article really confusing. I, I, you know, had to read it a few times to, to really find out what was the point and who was the actual target. But look, I, I've just got to agree with some of my fellow panellists that, uh, yeah, the, if people are worked up and if the female reporters in Canberra are worked up about this, well, I think we can all understand why. Mm. And maybe we need to have a bit more of a reflection on the types of work environments that they've come up through and what they're seeing and what they're reporting on. I think it's a pretty dangerous precedent to start, then start uh, having journalists labeling, labeling other journalists as, as activists. Mm. And I just don't think it, it, uh, it would really be an area that we want to start moving down into because, you know, we can start pulling holes in it uh, everywhere we look. Um, you're familiar with, with politics and politicking, Niall. Like, looking at this story, if we have a, a leading journalist who has broken story after story about this alleged rape of Brittany Higgins and, and other stories as well, um, if we see a, a, an article kind of just kind of questioning her credibility in a way, who, who benefits from that? Well, again, this is where I'm a bit confused with the story. I, I'm trying to find out where the angle is and, and who it's being targeted at. and, and you know, the, the, the media always try never to be the story. I mean, I know it might become a little bit salacious if there's, you know, um, a bit of competition within the industry and, and reporting on each other, but this is the media turning on the media in a way that, that is bizarre and it's almost like it's carried over from a little bit of who was going to be representing the press in Canberra versus, you know, who was the real target in the, in the Prime Minister's comments and... And, and it just, to me, doesn't add up. I think it's probably a bit misguided. Um, and as I said, I don't think it's helpful for anyone. I wish I was smart enough to work out uh, mm. who, was, who was behind this and what the target was. But I think there's wheels within wheels with this one. And I think it's a really dangerous topic to be, to be playing some of those games. But it's safe to say, isn't it, that it's not the women making the allegations that would benefit from that, from having the person who's telling their stories be undermined? No. No, no. As I said, I'm, yep. I'm certainly not, you know, uh, <laughs> subscribing to the fact that sure. this is a group of, of activists and activists, you know, journalism. 
I, I was trying to work out what it was trying to achieve and where it was going. And, mm. and I, I've got to say, I'm, I'm just left a little bit more confused after reading it mm. um, than, than what I thought the real issue was to be addressing. Um, sure. This isn't the main game. Yep. Well, let's talk about the main game because a key part of many of these discussions has been whether sex and consent education is going far enough. For many people, the events of the last few weeks have led them to reflect on their own actions, with some even realising they have perpetrated sexual assault. We put a movie on and then we started like, kissing on the couch and I sort of tried to keep putting my hand out her pants. She kept saying, no, I just don't feel well. This is my goal. We're having sex with you like it or not. Eventually, I sort of persuaded her to give me a wristy, basically. Um, and yeah, pretty much after that was finished, I literally just left. Looking back now, she was 100% in fear. Like, she was like really hesitant to do anything like except kiss. And I sort of went in a downward spiral of, I guess, depression, like I can't believe I've done this. Now, the realisation that he had sexually assaulted someone led the perpetrator, referred to as Marcus, to track down his victim on Facebook to apologise. She responded with this. Look, it's in the past. I try not to think about it or any other time it's happened to me. So thanks for the apology. This is just one of many messages from young men sent to Triple J's hack. Hack reporter Daria Salmon told the drums Bethan Smolnik the response has been overwhelming. We've been receiving a lot of messages from listeners who not only are realising for the first time that they've experienced sexual assault or rape from their past, but a lot of guys as well who are realising that they've actually sexually assaulted someone. Marcus got in touch with us and sent us a message on Instagram and basically said, like, thank you for all the coverage you've been doing over the past couple of weeks about consent. It's actually now because of that that I've realised um, an instant when I was 17, I've actually sexually assaulted a girl. And I reached out to her and apologised. Marcus at the time said he didn't have a father figure. So he always wanted to kind of figure out, you know, how do I be a man? And he, he looked to movies like American Pie. And they told him, you just have to get laid. Like you have to have sex and that's how you're going to be a man. And so, you know, in his mind he was like oh well I'll just get laid and I'll have sex and that's you know that's how I'll become this like great man. It's a lot of the kind of response we've been receiving from young women as well is just saying that like I thought that that culture was okay and young men thought that that culture was okay and I think that's like one of the big conversations that we're really having at the moment. We spoke to a, an expert from Monash, um, Dr Silky Meyer, she's an associate professor in criminology. And she's basically saying that what it actually comes down to is that men need to hold men accountable. And it's about looking to your day-to-day -day lives. You know, are, are the people around you making sexist or derogatory comments? And if they are, you need to hold them accountable. It's about changing this shift in culture. Navar, do you think this is this this uh, this could be some kind of cultural shift if men do start to hold people around them accountable do start to look at consent in a different way and think through past actions as well as talking to people around them i want to say yes but at the same time i'm really apprehensive about giving these men awards for the very very bare minimum like i understand that you know, the lack of sexual education in this very conservative country has led to a lot of misunderstandings around enthusiastic consent and around safe sex practices. But by the same token, if you are not aware of what is going on in our society and you have noise cancelling headphones on while survivors are screaming from the rooftops and have been for a very long time. This country was conceived off the back of colonial sexual assault. If you have those headphones on, who is that a reflection of? You know, there's a certain extent in which we just can't pat these guys on the back for finally looking at the ways that they've treated people. And I also want to say that if you can't really discern between someone genuinely enjoying sex and really being uncomfortable and being violated, then there's a really big issue there. I think that's the deeper. issue we're talking about, isn't it? And 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 I mean, my, in in the article that was written by um, the hack reporter it was like his, a bloke was saying, I just didn't realise you could withdraw consent during the act. I thought that it was just you just began, and then it was on. So um, obviously, this is a really important 
conversation. Are any men around you, Niall, having these conversations at the moment or talking about what, what's being exposed? Uh, I think it's the, um, it's the thing that everyone's talking about at the moment. Mm. And, uh, you know, look, I, I do understand that it's important to to have more conversations around consent. And I, and I know that, you know, these, these sort of stories of men coming forward and say, hey, listen, I'm, I'm a bit reflective on my uh, previous behaviour. Look, I think that's important in the context of consent, but I also, I also don't want us to jump now and, um, as Navala said, you know, start rewarding people for, for coming forward in that space until we have all of the support mechanisms in place for victims and, and, and have a victim-centred approach that we're confident is, is there to support everyone. So, yeah, definitely important in the conversations around consent. It's the thing that everyone is, is talking about. Um, my, my, myself as a, a father, you know, we've all got it on our minds. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, let's, let's not also lose sight of why we're having these conversations and let's make sure we've got those systems in place to make sure that we have a, a victim-centred approach and provide all of the resources available. And uh, let's move into this area of men coming forward and, you know, maybe, I don't know if they're looking for a pat on the back or is it to educate others, but we're gonna be really careful in this space that we don't lose sight of what the real, the real issue is. Mm. Aisha, you've spoken on this, on this show before about your experience in abusive relationships. How important is it that, that perpetrators of abuse or of sexual assault recognise what they've done? <clears throat> it's actually fundamental. And I'm listening to the conversation and it's really important conversation and we have to actually, I need to make a few points. Firstly, when a man apologises, right, true, it's not about giving him an award. But it's not even about individuals in the situation. Often when you have the dyad or the binary of a, a perpetrator, victim, survivor, often it's the victim that's highlighted and has a responsibility to speak out and questions around what the victim did or didn't do or the, or the choices he or she made. And often it's the perpetrator, in this case we're generalising and saying it's the male perpetrator, who is part of the dominant group. And part of that power structure is to be invisible in order to escape that responsibility and that scrutiny. So what happens now we've got, you know, Triple J um, coming out with all these men who are saying, well, hang on, we want to be part of the conversation. And we have to move away from that historical narrative of that it's the women's responsibility to be the activists and to voice and then supported by a few good men. See, perpetrators aren't these monsters that come out of the swamp and they attack and then they go back. Right. You know, they're everyday men, they're our fathers, they're our husbands, they're our sons. I'm a single mother. My children have also been exposed to what happened to me. And so it's not just women who are victimised and have to survive. It's young boys and children who are also part of that. If you take um, a group of men, for example, do they talk about this? Usually, no. In actual fact, there's a peer culture that either looks the other way or that's a women's issue, just like gender's a, a woman's issue, race is for people of colour, it's not for white people. It's the same sort of assumption that underpins these discussions. We all become bystanders. We all have a responsibility. Fundamentally, this is not a women's... It's an issue where they are at the, at the forefront. Men are part and parcel of this. This is a man's issue as well. Mm -hmm. And we have a responsibility also when it comes to toxic masculinity to educate as a society so that men have the, the, the ability and not just putting the responsibility on, 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 the, on the teenage boys and the children. It's about the, the adult men in power who are part of institutions who are making policy priorities and decisions yeah. and, and enabling those processes. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. We can move on to some <laughs> other panels. I can say okay. a lot about this. And I do have to say again here, if you've been affected at all by anything we've been discussing, call Lifeline on 13 11 14 or 1800 RESPECT on 1800 737 732. But just before we move on, I want to point out some of the other great work our colleagues at Triple J's Hack are doing. Today they released footage of New South Wales Police arresting an Aboriginal teen who was having an anxiety attack and a warning. Some may find this disturbing. 
Tanisha Witters can be seen being slammed to the ground by officers. Now, at the time, her boyfriend had been helping her after they pulled over to get some air. He says he tried to explain to police that she was having a panic attack. New South Wales police have spoken to Hack and defended the officer's behaviour. Now, for more on that story, visit the Triple J Hack website and you can listen to their program on weekdays at 5.30 or online. Now, much has been made about the end of the job keeper support payment this week and the loss of jobs that will inevitably follow. According to Treasury, as many as 150,000 people could be out of work by the week's end. For some, this may be temporary, but others will find themselves relying on unemployment benefits. But here's the rub. Tomorrow, the job seeker supplement is also being wound back. It's worth remembering that at the height of the COVID emergency, the original payment, then called New Start, was doubled overnight to $1,100. That's been slowly tapered back, falling to $720 at the start of 2021. From tomorrow, it falls again to $620. The government has legislated a $50 fortnight increase on the base rate and the full amount varies based on the number of children you care for and whether you have a partner or a disability. Australian musician Lauren Gaffiero, or Gaffy as she's known on stage, is one of thousands who've been claiming the allowance. COVID has been a very big jolt in my life. Uh, it's been really good on the upside that I have had the opportunity to have a pause because I've been a creative living off my art for like 13 years. I haven't had like any other job, like I've been my own boss for 13 years. I moved back in with my parents for six months and so I could survive off Centrelink. You know, I'm actually really grateful for, you know, the money that they have provided. What's that on your screen? So I think like it was that explaining to them, just because it looks like to you that I don't have a job right now, it doesn't mean that I'm not working, you know? Like I'm still working every day and making stuff, being creative and doing photo shoots and, you know, getting ready for like when it goes, you know, everything gets back on. Like I have applied for some stuff and then I've looked through what the offers are on the website. I'm like, I, I can't do any of these jobs. I've got an artist CV. I was in, you know, Switzerland on this stage and I was in Japan. You know, it's like just saying where I've been and what I've done. And that just means nothing to Centrelink. So I've kind of like explained to them, look, I think the easiest thing is for you just to take a look at my Instagram. And I think that'll just explain everything. <laughs> Now, first of all, Summit, just what this is going to mean in people's daily lives. I mean, Aisha, what will a, the, the drop in job seeker mean for you? Well, I loved that story in the package just then. I think that really resonated because when you are working for yourself or you're project based or you're in the creative industries or you're a single parent or whatever it is you're doing, um, it is going to have an impact. You know, it's it's interesting, in some people's lives, $50 doesn't make a difference, but for some people, it can be the difference between being able to do a proper grocery shop or taking care of the kids' essential needs. I think there's a lot of assumptions about, oh, well, you know, we, we did it for, for COVID to, to get them through. Well, we're not exactly out of the woods yet. And we're not exactly in, well, except in WA, we do have economic growth, but nationally speaking, <laughs> oh, sorry back to, to rub WA it in. Again. <laughs> sorry to rub it in. Um, but, you know, generally, it's a really tough um, um, a job job market out there and it's not that people are doing nothing people are, are doing a lot every day and I, I made a point earlier um, in a conversation about how that extra supplement um, has been used by a lot of people I know in actual fact as a resource to plan for when everything goes back to whatever the new normal is going to look like in the future and so they are hustling and they are making plans and, you know, reading the articles about this decision um, to give the, the COVID supplement has lifted a million people out of poverty, 75,000 children. You know, as a society, what does that say about us, you know, in terms of we are here to also look after the most vulnerable vulnerable people in our lives, those uh, that are disproportionately affected and will be, will be women and, and those who are homeless and finally were able to find shelter during during mm. this time, those with mental health challenges. And to strip that away um, so suddenly is going to have disastrous consequences. 
And Naval, what about what about you? I understand you and you've said every single one of your friends is also relying on Job Seeker at the moment. What are the prospects looking like for you and for them? Yeah, you know, majority of my friends have been probably living off Centrelink for a really long time, especially within the trans community, you know, when we're thinking about the general population and how it's going to affect them. We also need to consider how it's going to affect more marginalised groups and, you know, transgender people experience unemployment rates at about 19%, which is three times higher than the Australian general public. So what did that look like during COVID is just kind of escalated. You've also got access to healthcare and you've got so many other obstacles for trans people living their lives lives and living their truth, um, I don't really know what's going to happen and I feel really nervous about it. You know, I don't know what I would have done if I didn't have access to JobKeeper as a freelance artist and public speaker in a very changing world. And I think what this has shown is that our government can actually help us and can pull people out of poverty and they're choosing not to. Mm. Nikki, where, where, does this, where does this leave us now? We've had the government saying, oh, we'll, we'll put it up by $50. Um, a, a fortnight, but every study, and there was one in, at the end of in November last year, um, before that increment was announced, when Peter Martin and, and the conversation spoke to I think 45 of the, of the country's leading economists, you know, almost all of them thought that it should be increased by substantially more than, than what we've seen. So there's, there's a whole load of... I mean, you could talk about this for the whole hour, this subject. I right. mean, there, it's, it's very complicated. But there are, it is one of the areas where there are so many lies that are told. One of them is if we raise the rate that, that everyone will just lie around and be bludgers. And this is one of the interesting things I find, that there's this idea that if you lost your job during COVID, somehow you're more worthy than somebody who lost <laughs> their job or couldn't find a job. The idea that anybody just can get a job... I mean, you know, as a parent of somebody who's transgender, I know how hard it is for them, whether it's because of mental health issues or because they're not accepted by the broader community. Not everybody can get a job the way they want to. And the idea that there's bludgers out there. But the biggest thing about all of this is, you know, the government says, well, it costs us too much money. What they're not taking into account is the full costs of enforcing people to live in poverty. And whatever your definition of the poverty line is, these people who are on job seeker, as it will be as of today, tomorrow, are living in poverty. They can't access the health things that they need to access. Because they've got low incomes, they have poor nutrition, they're more likely to be um, obese, to, to have diabetes. Mm. Um, so they need more health, health um, care from the government, which costs us. Mm. Their children will have poor outcomes. So that's lack of productivity. Mm. That's If you look at it purely from an economic statistic, or forget the heart and soul of what this, and, and being a decent human being, it actually doesn't make sense, just from a cost-benefit basis. So, yeah, but then you add add what's decent and right, and you know, people eating two meals a day and their kids can't go to school or they've got shoes with holes. Mm. I, it just what does it say about our country? We are, you know, right at the bottom of the OECD table. I want to come back to the <laughs> question of poverty and and how it's defined and where the poverty line is. But Niall, the government will will and has said repeatedly, if they increase it by by too much, that will provide a disincentive for people to find jobs. Do you agree with that? Look, it I agree that firstly we could talk about this, uh, a whole show dedicated to this area and the other thing I'd say, whoever is making any decisions about what dates to switch things off, you should always circle 1st of April and say we will never do something on that day. It's almost <laughs> too, uh, it's almost too easy uh, to, to run a narrative around that. But. Um, Look, I, I also think it's it's pretty lazy just to say that people won't go looking for, for jobs. And and the irony is, is a lot of the industries that I work with, we're actually crying out for people, but it's getting those people, or getting people to those areas, particularly after things like lockdown that's been the issue. The other thing is, I actually think it's quite insulting to those that um, have lost their job, that maybe are a bit too proud to put their hand up and, and say that they're doing it tough, um, just to then label them all as people that don't want to work. Uh, you know, we've heard from the other panel members, uh, panel members here tonight, there's many reasons why people um, need to get these sort of, um, these sort of subsidies uh, from the government. Um, you know, we saw the, the lines of people being interviewed um, when COVID hit, that there's people saying that I would, I'd never thought in my wildest dreams that I'd be, be lining up um, to ask for help, and it is it is an issue to ask for help, um, and uh, and and I think that 
it's just pretty simple to just just say, look, you know, if we put the, the money up, no one will go and, and get some work. We actually saw that, uh, that th there are a whole range of reasons why people may need some help, and, and this is not a one-size-fits-all. Yeah, and can I just follow it up? Um, well, actually, whoever pr presses the buzzer first between Nikki and um, Niall here on responding to this. I'm interested also in the fact that the Minister for Family and Social Services and Rushton said, oh, I don't think we can, uh, you know, what were her exact words about, we, we have to be careful making a judgment in relation to poverty. There's always a dispute about where a poverty line is, whether there's absolute poverty and relative poverty. But if I can quote the conversation again, thank you for your work. Uh, a piece yesterday saying th the headline is there are lots of poverty lines and job seeker doesn't keep people above any of them. Ben Phillips, his associate professor who wrote it, said the one, uh, the only established poverty line in Australia is a Melbourne Institute poverty line, which is both absolute and relative poverty. And it suggests it's around $1,100 per fortnight, which is what the COVID job seeker rate was. What, what does this what does this tell us, Niall? And do we then, what are we then saying by going by, by going back to a far lesser rate now? Again, that uh, this is such a complex area, and 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 you know, I, I know that governments don't go out of their way just to just to you know try and be mean in some of these areas, and there are a whole range of things to to take into consideration. Um, but again. You know, if we just strip back and just say that the only way to address this issue is to cut a cheque to someone, then, then yeah, we're going to have that debate. We need to think about what other support measures we put in place for people. Yes, <laughs> money may be needed, but there, there needs to, at, at times, probably be other support measures that are just as valuable a, as cutting a cheque. So I'm certainly not an expert in this area. It's an area that, that I know that, there's, as I said before, there are people that never thought they'd find themselves in this situation. Right, but just I to bring in... Oh, sorry, you've mentioned experts yeah. and, and, and Nikki is and just wanted to quickly get something in before we move on. Sure, sure. Yeah, you mentioned, all that, you know, governments aren't being mean, but I'd actually argue that this government actually deliberately is and it's it, they have had a clear message throughout, in fact, even before COVID, of saying, we don't want to make life too easy for people on unemployment benefits, as if people are making that active choice to be unemployed you know, as, as, a, as a group, as a whole. Look, I agree, there are lots of ways we need to support people. We need to give them you know, medical treatment. We need to give them transport passes. We need to give them training so that we get the right people into the right jobs. But the overlay on all of this as well is also mutual obligations, which is gonna make it even harder for people now that that's coming back to find the right job and to actually maximise the investment in their education, their training, their productivity. It's, none of it makes sense from, a, from an economic or from a wellbeing point of view. It's quite frustrating. OK, well, it's something we can continue to talk about on the drum um, as it continues to unfold. But I want to tell you a story now. This is a story of Reverend Josephine Inkpin. She recently made history, becoming the first transgender person to be inducted into a mainstream church. We first met Jo in 2018 after she came out to her Anglican church in Sydney and then nationally on this show. Since doing that, she's blazed a trail for others and has been largely embraced by her church community. She now ministers to the Pitt Street Uniting Church in Sydney, where our reporter Stephanie Bolchi caught up with her. For much of Jo Inkpin's life, the world saw a man. But the Anglican priest privately fought with the reality she was female. And in 2017, Jo came out to her Brisbane Anglican community and the parish her wife was a rector at. Is religion about transformation, which a lot of us believe, or is it about order and keeping people in boxes? Four years on, her visible transformation has been life-altering. I know myself as truly loved by God, whereas before I felt myself as if I was, you know, always, I was as a question mark. Um, and that's an awful thing to have, especially as a minister. Jesus invites us to share in this divine way of creative transformation. Dr Inkpin was already a priest when she came out. So when Jo became a minister at Pitt Street Uniting, she became the first trans person to be inducted into an Australian mainstream church. There was sorts of tears of joy as well. Um, and a lot of joy of coming home, really, I think. 
Her wife, Reverend Penny Jones, was one of the UK's first female priests. We're not just in the, filling the pews, but we're up front and sharing our gifts. That, that's terrifically enabling for other people, I think. And it, and it challenges, you know, desacralises, as it were, the sort of idea that certain people are called to powerful positions and others, you know, just have to follow on. Give us courage. While Jo says she was supported, she says trans people, like her, are often spoken about rather than with. We become a political football in many cases, so being highly visible, therefore, you know, been drawn into some of that. So it's sort of been a little bit exhausting. In 2019, the Anglican Diocese of Sydney, which makes rules for its churches, passed a doctrine statement on gender identity blurring the distinctions between male and female or seeking to present one's sex as contrary to one's biology is an attempt at self-creation that involves a denial of the biologically sexed body that God has given to us. It's a credible ideological statement really which sort of ignores the experience of people like myself and medical expertise, professional expertise and the cost of it is, all, is terrible for people. It reinforces the shame and the exclusion and the pain that lots of people feel because they don't feel as if they're properly accepted by God. Challenging our preconceptions and calling us to ever surprising love. And that makes her move to Sydney even more poignant because currently she wouldn't be inducted as an Anglican priest. Sydney particularly has got a very strong um, conservative reform tradition. So um, it hasn't yet accepted female leadership and doesn't have that ethic of equality. So that's a big problem in itself. Jo says her gender was never raised when she went for the Uniting Church position. We own the progressive strand of Christianity to encompass those who sometimes struggle in other church traditions, they're not recognised properly for who they are. This church uh, endears me greatly because it's open and receptive to people of all walks of life, no matter what. I think she'll bring great energy, great depth of uh, understanding of theology, but also of social issues. Just to know that there's somebody like me, what a difference it makes to know that someone else is like that, and to see us represented um, in public space is, is really huge. Reverend Jo Inkpin with Stephanie Bolchi there, and I should also say that she came out to her parish in Queensland, not in Sydney. It certainly is not a likely scenario in Sydney Anglican churches currently. Navo, can I ask you why, um, why is this kind of visibility so important? Yeah, it's a really good question. You know, I think that trans people have been teetering on the edge of hypervisibility and invisibility for all of time. I think mm. that a lot of our ancestors lived in the shadows without any representations of themselves and no imaginings of their future whatsoever. And I think sort of as we've moved through time, we're now experiencing this kind of influx of hypervisibility in which we are written about in the media constantly, in which The Australian has written a... a comparative PhD thesis on <laughs> uh, trans identities in our lives and we are so hyper visible that young people are now growing up in a way that they are very aware of how society feels about them as trans and gender diverse people. So I think any representation that we can get is really beautiful and really valuable and I think being able to see futures for ourselves means that we can live them. You know, I had a young person message me recently and say, seeing a non-binary adult makes me feel like I can make it to a adulthood mm -hmm. and I really resonate with that because when I came out as trans I had no blueprints from what my future could look like I didn't see myself represented anywhere and that's why we have a 48.1 percent suicide attempted suicide rate in young trans and gender diverse people that's mm -hmm. one in two and that's a statistic but that's my friends right. you know Th those are the young people that I work with so the more representation we can get I think the much bigger change this makes that's huge, people telling you they'll make it to adulthood now. That actually, that is huge. Now, you have a, a, a simple way, I understand, of explaining trans identity to people. Yeah, I mean, can as simple as it can be, I think. <laughs> so, so an analogy I really like to use in the professional development workshops that I run is I want you for a, for a moment to imagine that you're a can of lentils. Suspend your disbelief. I promise it's, it's not vegan propaganda, not this time. Uh, and, and someone comes along and slaps a label on you that says coconut milk. And you're like, 
I don't know what to tell you, but I'm not coconut milk. Unless you literally open me up and look inside, you're not going to know that. But I guarantee if you put me in a pina colada, you're going to be very disappointed with all these lentils. <laughs> and so being trans is not the process of this lentils becoming coconut milk or even becoming lentils, but rather the process of changing that label on the outside to reflect what was always on the inside. Mm. So that could look like getting a haircut, coming out on Facebook, getting surgery or taking hormones, whatever it may be, but it's about what was always in the inside. And I think that's the problem is a lot of people think that by letting trans people transition, that is what makes us trans. But right. we are always trans. If you stop us from transitioning, it only makes us miserable. <laughs> um Nikki, what have you learnt from having a, a trans daughter? Well, I, I wish Trans Day of Visibility had been much bigger when, you know, when she was younger and, and that I had known more about it. So um, it has been really hard for us to go along the journey. But all I know is that we love her no matter what and for us to support her. But, you know, I've walked down the street with her and I've seen people stare and, you know, I'm cool with that, but my heart breaks for her sometimes I mean she actually a year ago moved to Japan because she said to me I'd rather people stare at me and think it's because I'm white instead of Japanese rather than because I'm trans mm -hmm. and you know the statistic uh, that Navo quoted you know you as a parent you live with that every day thinking how are they going to cope how they're going to cope and she's had all the help and support that you can get her friends our family have been amazing I thank every single one of them but it is a hard road. And so the more people that are out there, the Nouveau's, you know, um, the, the, the ink pins, all these people to show. I mean, we talk about this with, with women as well. You know, you can't be what you can't see. Mm. So the more we have these leaders, the more we educate people, the more we can unravel that unconscious bias and say, this is, you know, this is who people are. You can't change. I love your, I love your analogy, Nouveau. That is just beautiful and I will adopt that. Mm. Um, you know, but it is, it's not an easy road, but these sorts of days, these sorts of discussions will help us all. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully, you know, people can just move beyond their, their bias, conscious or unconscious, and, and understand that for some people, this is the way that they are. And please ask somebody about what their pronouns are. Don't just assume, and don't assume because somebody looks to you in a particular way that their gender or their sexuality is anything in particular. Ask, get involved, have the conversation and just be a decent human being, please. Mm. And I think um, we've only got about 10 seconds left, Navo, but I know you've, you've, got, you've got a book coming out called The Pronoun Lowdown, so you're, you're kind of the expert on this. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, people get overwhelmed by how fast things are changing and trying to keep track of stuff, and I so get the apprehensions we have sometimes, but the reality is is that everything's changing all the time. You know, right. technology is changing almost as fast as our prime ministers, <laughs> and we just got to get on board, you know? You just got to get involved, ask the questions, be there, we're here, it's exciting, the trans revolution is coming, <laughs> um, right. and, and it's a brilliant time to be alive. <laughs> and we're always out, running out of time now. We're going to end on that positive note. Thanks so much, Nikki Hutley, Niall Blair, Navo Sisson and Aisha Novakovic. Hope you have a great evening. You can have Ellen back with you tomorrow. I hope you have a